Hello. This is the first of two talks which I'm going to give about war. This talk is about understanding war. The second talk I'm going to give is healing war or ending war. So it would be nice if you listen to this one first and then listen to the other because then they'll make a little bit more sense. So I'm now going to jump in to what we can do to understand war more better. And I'm going to frame my talk around the two big wars that are going on, um, the Russian-Ukraine war and the Israeli-Hamas war. And I'm also going to touch on the Iraq war. Okie dokes. So I'm going to put my glasses on and get ready. Hello. Right. One of the ways that evil, of the many ways that evil finds expression in the world is through war. At any time, there's many wars going on, small wars in the world. Right now, as I just said, the world is in the middle of two big wars, both of which are pulling in other countries. And there's a lot of danger in the world. And if you happen to be living in Ukraine, or Russia, or the Gaza Strip, or Israel, there's a tremendous amount of suffering going on. And when I talk about war, I also want to talk about the nature of the killing process in general, because war is especially about killing. I don't want to try and speculate what's going to happen in these two wars. I'm no military strategist and I'm no crystal ball gazer. And many outcomes could take place. And it would be rather lovely, I hope, if by the time you're looking at this video that a peace had happened or some negotiated settlement were to have taken place that I don't know. We'll see. But what I want to do here is to use these wars to take you a little deeper into the reasons behind what, why wars happen in the first place so that you can see that whatever other particular triggers or catalysts, they have a certain similarity to them. All wars. Sam Keane wrote a book many years ago, a terrific book called Faces of the Enemy. Here's what he said. We have no chance of lessening warfare unless we look at the psychological roots of paranoia, projection, and propaganda, nor if we ignore the special interests of power elites, the historic, racial, economic, and religious conflicts, and population pressures that sustain the war system. And I'm going to do my best to touch on these themes. And I'm going to try also to do so in the spirit of the great peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh, when he told us to look deeply in the truth, into the truth of war. Many view it 
as a moral clean and liberating because they have not seen it through the eyes of heart. So I'm going to try to do it through the eyes of heart. And the eyes of heart, because I'm going to be talking a lot about heart in the second, in my second talk about how we end war, but the eyes of heart mean with a more expanded vision of what war is about. And I want to start by telling you that contrary to what you may feel or know, wars have not always existed. When we lived on earth as hunter-gatherers and moved around all the time, there was no evidence of war. Sorry. Pulled out my little earphones. And that thousands of years before the advent of religion, people living in shamanic cultures were naturally conscious of the grandeur of nature and felt very much that they lived within a sacred order. And at that time, there existed a great reverence for life and women in particular were respected and had a very large role to play in these hunter-gathering societies. And here's what Anne Baring said in her great book, The Dream of the Cosmos, A Quest for the Soul. <clears throat> the rise of patriarchal religions that emphasized our fallenness as opposed to our blessedness saw this containment within a sacred order fall away gradually fade away. And as humanity's ego developed, it did so in unhealthy ways, and we began to lose our deep instinctive sense of connection to nature. And the shaman who saw soul in all things and who revered the natural world became replaced by the hero or conqueror who didn't, and instead saw his role as needing to overcome obstacles and kill evil dragons. So, in a word, this signified the emergence of a disconnection from nature and a patriarchal worldview where our collective consciousness became increasingly infused with ideas of conflict, which has led us to believe that wars have always existed and are innate to us. And again, you can understand this if we look back at our history that has been nothing but a mass of wars for centuries and centuries, and the ancient Greeks, for example, saw war as something to be glorified in. And if you ever read Simon Sabag Montefiore's superb book on Jerusalem, you'll see it's nothing else. It's the story of nothing else but Muslim, Jews, and Christians butchering each other in the name of God. In fact, more people have died in the name of God, and it's brought up more violence than anything else. I'll get to that in a moment. Now, a lot of us think that wars happen just because of them. They, whoever they are, are war leaders, are warmongers, are the warlike ones, not us. We're the innocent. Again, the Vietnamese activist Thich Nhat Hanh, we said, we all have war inside us, not just the soldiers. And of course, this applies more strongly to some of us than to others, and especially to the leaders of those countries who all too often take their nations to war not because their peoples want war,
but because they feel it will enhance their own personal prestige and their own personal interest. Certainly this was the case with Putin, who identified, probably a bit less so now, but at the time he marched into Ukraine, he identified with the great empire builders like Peter the Great, Stalin, and had always felt that Ukraine was part of Russia. He thought it would add to his prestige and the prestige of his country. Here we also remind ourselves that Margaret Thatcher started a war over who owned the Falkland Islands. And it activated a nationalistic fervor. And it certainly played a part in helping her win the next election. And she was no doubt aware of the rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves, that old colonial mindset still resonated amongst the British. Actually, I'm smiling, it's not funny at all. Was very serious. And as we all know, they manifest themselves in many different varieties. They can be about trade or money or religion or conflicts over different ideologies. Wars can be short or long. One war lasted for 40 years. And they can be hot or cold. And, and following the de defeat of the Axis powers, an ideological and political rivalry rose up between the United States and the USSR, which gave rise to the start of the Cold War. People didn't get killed, but there was a warlike mindset. Or there was a killing mindset in other ways than stabbing daggers into other people's hearts. And today, we've got all sorts of wars going on. They're not about trade or, or, um, or cyber. Um, and they're also wars for people against their own countrymen. In, in fascist regimes or in tyrannical regimes like in Iran, there's a war against the women to keep them down. And if you go on marches and you don't wear your thing around your head, you might get shot in the eye or raped or imprisoned. And that's a war. It's a killing of a heart. And what I need to say is that wars don't just emerge out of nothing. That they're a part of the furniture of the system that we live in, the patriarchal system that we live in, that is essentially warlike. And one could say that they're a reflection of the way our world works, or more accurately, fails to work. Certainly, there's a war against planet Earth, isn't there? All those who disregard the sanctity of the environment and pollute it, and all the many ways that they do it and don't take care of the environment. those people who dig for more oil or try to cut down the rainforests, the lungs of the planet, what allows our mother earth to breathe. <gasps> ah. So our planet can't breathe so well. And no wonder we're, we're facing all these droughts and um, tsunamis and um, storms and earthquakes. 
it's a reflection of the warlikeness or the lack of disregard or reverence for our planet. And poor old Mother Earth is fighting back. <clears throat> A few days ago, for example, I was horrified to read in the newspaper that the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has granted 27 new North Sea drilling, drilling licenses. And he's happy to trash the planet and to contribute to global warming in order to placate the money boys, the, the corporate world. And this isn't an isolated incident. It go, it's typical of what goes on all the time in many countries and on the part of many people who talk about themselves as having green aspirations. And I was in a video game shop to try and buy a game for a young child. And I saw how many of them were about war and killing. It's one terrible game that you kill zombies. Wow, I mean, really weird. And the same with movies. There's so many war movies and movies about serial killers. Um, I was watching Netflix. I don't know what mistake I made, but 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 all the movies that they seemed to show me were about serial killers. I don't know what I'd done wrong, you know. Um perhaps some Google eye, some sort I mean, our world is coming under more and more observations, you know, and perhaps um some system saw me doing a bit of research for this talk and thought, ah yes, this guy is into war. And so let's send him up all the all the killing movies that um, that uh, we've got. But anyway, the idea of war being a fact of life is inculcated into children at a very early age. And we mustn't also forget that wars are very financially profitable and in a certain way, the terrible thing is that the economic system seems to evolve around wars and as the um in the era of the american neocons there was this weird statement that we need perpetual war for perpetual peace i mean what the hell does that mean really perpetual war for perpetual peace well America's been good at war. We have to remind ourselves, you know, she's had the Korean War, the Vietnam War. She interferes in a lot of countries' um, you know, policies. And if they don't sort of suit her, she'll make sure that they do. So there's no country that is innocent of this, of this warmongering that, as I said, is part of the mindset of our planet. And now we're living in a time where two major wars have broken out. And that's why we need to think much more seriously about war, because it's putting the whole planet in danger. Because when, yeah, so what are wars about? They're about dehumanizing and killing. And actually, there's many ways that we can be a killer without needing to dress up as a soldier in car keys and, and, and carry submachine guns. Here's what Hermann Hesse wrote at the time of the First World War. We kill at every step, not only in wars, riots, and executions. <clears throat> we kill when we close our eyes to poverty, suffering, and shame. In the same way, all disrespect for life, all hard-heartedness, all indifference 
all contempt is nothing more than killing. Powerful words. So to fight wars were called to close off to the more human parts of ourselves that can feel. If you see sort of movies on serial killers, I mean, I couldn't help sort of having seen one because it was beamed up, I thought, sort of, let's have a go, sort of, what's it about? And you saw that this person was walled off from himself so that it was easy for him to kill because he didn't feel. So we have to shut down our humanity to fight wars. And what helps this shutting down of humanity, of our humanity, is the language that we use to speak about those who we decided to be our enemy at a particular time. Because wars are about, well, I'll, I'll just explain this, there's something in us that we always seem to be needing to find someone to hate, some religious group, some race, some, um, some, some people with skins a different color from us. And, and when we hate, we shut down our humanity. And <clears throat> if, as what happened in the Second World War, you talk about the enemy as being rats, cockroaches or spiders, it's much easier to kill them. In the Korean War, I think the enemy were known as gooks. I mean, what's wrong in, in killing a stack of gooks? They aren't human beings. Netanyahu referred to the way that he would keep the Palestinians in place. He referred to it as mowing the grass. Those people, the Palestinians, had no more value to him than grass. And the Republican Party in America is increasingly moving in a warlike and inhuman direction. Only the war is not against an outer enemy, but it's against their own countrymen. Okay, sort of politics has always been oppositional, but it's never been a war. It's been two sides deciding different policies and coming together to find compromises, finding what's best from this side and that side. But now, under Trump, it's turned into warfare. And I just saw a news clip where the orange man threatened revenge against all those, I quote, corrupt, deep state people who've opposed him. And he used language when last heard in Nazi Germany in the, 1930, in the 1930s. And here's what he said, I will root out the communist, Marxist, racist and radical left thugs that live like vermin in, within the confines of our country. I mean, that's very scary language. He's projecting his own verminhood, his own dishonesty, his malignant narcissism, his hatred, his racism, his socio sociopathy, his criminality, not against an external enemy, but against his own people. And he needs an enemy. He needs someone or some people to hate and despise 
in order not to own the loathsomeness of his own end, of his own nature. And that's what happens in war. We create a world of good and bad, and I'm the good person, and those are the bad, and I am wanting to kill them, so then I'll be a good person. But actually, what we're doing is projecting our own, what we don't want to look at inside ourselves, onto them. A great example of that, again, is Putin, who said, that I am invading Ukraine to rid it of neo-Nazis. But who could be more neo-Naziistic, there is such a word, than Putin himself? So anyway, to come back to Trump, anyone who's not on his side becomes the enemy, becomes vermin and need extinguishing and I'm sure that if the tragedy happens and Trump does become president and let's hope and pray that this doesn't happen because God help America and God help the planet if it does, he's going to carry out his revenge tactics um, onto all those people who have challenged him on his criminality and, you know, the many um, terrible things that he's done, which I don't need to go on to, into here because we all know them. So war and Trump, and Trump, by the way, is quite a damaged human being. He had a dreadful childhood. Uh, a loveless childhood, so his soul or his heart from very early on was sort of crushed out of him. So there's a lot of trauma that goes into war. For example, to come back to the, to the two wars at the moment, you see that both the Israelis and the Palestinians in their different ways carry the scars of having been persecuted. The Israelis carry the scars of Auschwitz. The Palestinians carry the scars of having been treated in a pretty terrible way by the Israelis over the years. Um, as, as Netanyahu said, mowing the grass. And again, we can say that, that Putin's invasion of Ukraine was about his trying to compensate for its most recent trauma, namely the loss of its empire. So wars don't emerge out of nothing any more than serial killers' activities do. And that unhealed wounds manifest themselves in the history of nations in the same way that they do in us as individuals. And that just as damaged individuals or victimized individuals often want to do damage and victimize other individuals. So the same thing happens with damaged countries. So war, a war which creates wounds and deaths is a reflection of wounds and deaths. And the game goes on. And a big part of the damage of wars is that they traumatize hearts. We carry wounds inside our hearts. For example, <clears throat> my grandparents were white Russians. And when the revolution came, they had to escape Russia with their small children in order to avoid being 
butchered by the Bolsheviks who came to their gates. They only just got away in time. If they hadn't, it might have been curtains for them. So obviously my grandparents were very traumatized, losing everything. And they had to escape with their small, small children who'd just been born. And that trauma went from my grandparents to my dear mama and all her, all her brothers and sisters, that there was a certain damage that came into all of them. And again, that trauma goes back beyond the Russian Revolution, but it's gone through the history of Russia. If we go right back to the days of, um, you know, before Stalin, to Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, there's been a great history of trauma there. And so, you know, that's why when I talk about how we heal wars, we a big part of that is healing the traumas or the wounds that individuals and nations carry that then get replayed. And of course, um, as a psychotherapist, I see this in the patients who come to see me, that they have personal traumas which they've inherited and which they're going to hand on to their children and their children's children unless they work them through inside themselves. So I believe the head of the UN was absolutely right when he said that while Hamas's attacking of Israel was evil, despicable and indefensible, and I fully agree it was, murder and violence of the bl most bloodthirsty kind, that it didn't take place in a vacuum, that there was somehow a space that enabled this bloodthirstiness to arrive. Some see it as being about Hamas taking on the collective agony and rage of the Palestinians, as a result, I know some people won't like me saying this, but I'm going to say it, as the result of their having been subjected to what Auschwitz survivor Gabor Mate described as the longest ethnic cleansing in the 21st century. So while the ethnic cleansing bit is absolutely true, the Palestinians have been pressed down and squished down in a terrible way. But I'm not so sure that sort of Hamas did what they did just to revenge the fate of the Palestinians. In fact, I see that the Palestinians have been betrayed by Hamas almost as much as by the Israelis. And I think Hamas did what they did because somehow there was hatred inside their collective psyche. And they were motivated by a visceral and deep hatred of the Jews and a desire to destroy them. So again, I'm going to talk about in the second part of, of my talk, how we heal war, what, how do we heal that kind of visceral hate? How do we heal hatred? But the suffering that, that has been going on in the last few weeks with Israel's um, violent and vicious and I think over the top attack 
on Gaza in complete disregard of how many Palestinians and women and children are involved. I think it reflects another aspect of war, that there's a complete disregard for and demolition of any rules or human rights. Wars are, in, are essentially about dishonesty and telling lies and in and and behavior that has no ethics to it. In other words, once the cannonballs start flying, any semblance of human decency goes out of the window. And both Putin and Netanyahu are guilty of having committed war crimes. And the amount of schools and playgrounds and um, hospitals and residential houses that have been destroyed is enormous. So like, well, well, war leaders like to talk about the terrible terrorists who terrify. All war is essentially about terrorism and terrifying. And all wars are essentially about a desire to bring as much pain as possible to, to human beings, hearts, as well as to eliminate lives. That's part of war. All wars are terrorist activities, as I see it, according to the sayings of Serge. Now, I'm going to talk about the tragedy of Palestine and the tragedy of Israel. And I'm glad there's a lot of pro-Palestinian marches going on all over the world, because at last the Palestinian issue that's been ignored by so many countries is at last getting the recognition that it needs. And hopefully something will happen out of this that will improve a lot of the Palestinians. Because let's be honest, the Zionist vision of a Jewish state in Palestine could only be accomplished at the expense of the people already living there. And I think, and I'm reminded of the cuckoo who takes over other birds' nests. And I think one's got to accept that since 1948, the Israelis, in one way or another, have deprived the Palestinians of many of their basic rights and treated them as third-class citizens. And this has worsened under, um, in the years since Netanyahu has been in power. <clears throat> and one sees the deceit in the way that Netanyahu supported money being sent to Hamas because he thought foolishly that it would help thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state because he really didn't want to look at this seemingly impossible to heal issue. Sorry, I haven't explained it very well, but, but um, he thought that it would um, alleviate um, in, that, that if Hamas were paid, it would take care of the Palestinian issue. In fact, it didn't. And by financing his enemy, he, he, he thereby ensured that when it turned against him, it did so even more powerfully and brutally. So I'm glad, as I said, there's um, 
demonstrations going on on behalf of Palestine. And hopefully something healing can result from it. But Israel's also had a tough time. And it's not as if that country has not in the past made efforts to find a compromise with the Palestinians. I don't know enough about politics to know if the terms that were offered to, Palis to the Palestinians at the time of Yasser Arafat were good terms, because there seemed to be two opinions, one that they weren't good enough, and the other that the Palestinians should have taken those terms because they were really pretty favorable towards them. But anyway, it's not, I mean, the point I want to make is that it's not as if Israel has not early on tried. And we have to see that, okay, Netanyahu's revenge raid on Gaza, killing, I think as I, um, up to now about 12 or 13,000 Palestinians and thousands of women and children was over the top. One has to bear in mind that over a thousand Israelis were killed, many brutally tortured, prisoners taken. And it was very traumatic to a psyche already vulnerable and still carrying the wounds of the Holocaust. That Holocaust was something so terrible. that those wounds can maybe never be fully exorcised from the collective Jewish psyche. So the Israeli people are already insecure and vulnerable. And it ain't easy living in a small country surrounded on all sides by enemies who wish for nothing other but that they, they, their country be wiped off the face of the earth. I, I have concern for Israel because I feel that this over-the-top thuggery, and there's no better word for it, that Netanyahu showed in response to violence, is, is damaging Israel in the view of the rest of the world. And I fear that anti-Semitism will be on the increase and I fear that things may be more difficult for Israel in the future because building wars and possessing weaponry does not make you safe if you're hated. Remember Gandhi's wise words an eye for an eye makes everyone blind. Now, before I say anything more, I want to state unequivocally that I do not take sides. I refuse to live in a world or I refuse to create a reality for myself which my side is the good side, and I'm the goody, and the other's the bad side, and they're the baddie. I'm no more anti-Israel, and my father is Jewish, than I am anti-Russian. 
but I'm deeply, deeply critical of both countries' hyperbellicose leaders. I am on the side, my dear friends, of what benefits life and honors and supports the dignity of what it means to be human. And I will speak out whenever I see this being disregarded. An extreme anti-life, vicious and violent behaviors, whatever nation they come from, however justified they believe it to be. And regardless of whether it comes from the right wing or the left wing or the middle wing or whatever wing up there or down there, it needs to be condemned. It needs to be outed. And as you'll be seeing later where I explore some strategies to help lessen the pull of war on our psyches, I invite you to take stands for human integrity and do your best to draw people's attention to evil wherever we spot it. Evil needs to be outed. It needs to come out into the light of day so the sun can shine on it and disinfect it of its griminess and grisliness. So I never equate countries with their leadership. North Korea is not an evil country just because it has a crazy sort of, you know, psychopathic fat man, King Jong-un, who's into power and control, ruling it. I've been to Israel. It's a beautiful country. The most of the Israeli people are noble and fine and wise. And I was tremendously moved when I stayed there for some time and had the privilege to meet many Israeli people. And Many, I've talked to some friends of mine since the war, they're utterly horrified of the destruction which their ferocious right-wing leadership is currently unleashing upon the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. <clears throat> I've also been to Russia many times. My mama was part of the Russian royal family and I say the same thing. Because Russians have a big soul. Think Tolstoy, think Dostoevsky. In fact, in my office, I inherited from my mama. I have a wonderful photo of Tolstoy and his wife having tea. And as I write, I have him above me. And I'm sort of reminded of his beautiful Russian soul. And I say the same thing about Iran. And I mention Iran because Iran is part of this war as its leader is financing Hamas. The Iranians are wonderful people. They don't want this thuggish regime that they're being subjected to. And I'm so full of admiration for those brave, brave, Iranian women who are standing strong and, and walking in the streets with their head up, taking stands for their rights to be women and not to wear all that paraphernalia around their heads. So the thing that I object to very, very strongly is the ultra right wing fascistic leaders of those countries involved in starting war and whose regimes of paranoia and inhumanity only bring death and destruction to the world. 
and whose intentions could not be farther away from the desires of most of their most of their peoples. Okay, I'll say this. There are people in all these nations, but they aren't the majority by any means, who are xenophobic, fascistic, and nationalistic, and a lot of these people have been enlisted by the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran and by Putin, but they ain't the vast majority. I need to say something about the nuclear issue. All countries know the penalty. Those countries who have bombs, they all know the price they'll pay if they use them, i.e. that they'll get destroyed instantly back. The old doctrine of, of the mad doctrine, the mutually assured destruction. That said, the psychopathic leadership of these countries Think, think Netanyahu, think Putin. And I understand, by the way, why countries have worked so hard to make sure that the Ayatollah in Iran does not get his hands on a nuclear bomb. They all have a craziness and recklessness to them. And do you know that when Hitler lost the war, when he was told he lost the war, he gave instructions for the whole of his country to be destroyed? Just imagine what might have happened if Hitler had had a finger on the nuclear trigger. And the worrying thing is that Putin does. And what will Putin do if he sees himself losing the war? Will he see to the incineration of hundreds of thousands more innocent people just to save face? It's not off the books. He's already sacrificing hundreds of thousands of people for his own ego so that he doesn't lose because he's a frightened little man. He's afraid that if he loses, that, that he'll be knocked off his throne and meet the death that a lot of tyrants meet. Sort of look at what happened to, um, oh, what's his name? Um, ah, my memory has gone, but It'll come back. It'll come back in a moment. So we need to worry a, a bit or be concerned about how damaged and psychopathic these kinds of human beings are. What could Putin do? Again, we don't know. And that's why it's so urgent that the people of the world, i.e. you and I, the little people of the world, we aren't in government, we aren't famous people. Well, I'm not. I mean, sort of some of you who are looking at this video might be, but the ordinary sort of person in the world, why we need to take greater responsibility and don't leave this war issue to our leaders because this because of what i said of the war mongeringness that is part of the way that politics operates in the world today and the dreadful problem of trying to kill off evil as the israeli leadership is currently trying to do with Hamas is that this does not 
open up a space for goodness to emerge. On the contrary, to try to kill off evil, you have to use the very evil that you're trying to kill off. And so you turn into that very thing you're trying to destroy, and it only adds fuel to the fire, and so in, is encouraging the flames of hatred and violence to spread. What's going to happen for all those other um, people in the Middle East who have hatred for um, Israel? Beware, Nietzsche told us, that when you fight monsters, you do not become a monster. In most instances, one does. Now I'm going to get to the, I think, important point of looking at the psychology of war leaders, because this is absolutely central to the issue of war. Steve Taylor wrote a book called Disconnected, The Roots of Human Cruelty and How Consciousness Can Save the World. And in it, he suggested that there's many human beings on the planet who are very deeply disturbed. And Steve refers to them as being hyper disconnected, i.e. very separate from themselves, other people and the world out there. And these extremely damaged human beings is the traumatic childhood of Putin, Saddam Hussein and Hitler, for example. These deeply damaged human beings have little inner life or goodness in their hearts and have no sense of being part of the family or humanity. They're walled off from goodness and others and they experience virtually no empathy or goodness or compassion. I mean, that's an awful state to be. And if you're like that, you feel very empty because what fills us is the sense of our being connected to other people, being connected to nature. These people are very empty. So they try to fill themselves with things that they, in a kind of ersatz or a substitute way, because actually the only thing that can fill that, truly fill that emptiness is human goodness and soul, which I'll talk about in my next talk. But these people, these empty human beings who often have the cunning and manipulative skills to um, enter into high positions of power in the world, what they want is money, power and status. See Putin and Netanyahu, two little men inside themselves interested in status and grandiosity, power, it's all important for them. And that is the dangerous thing, because that's connected to war. And the Polish psychologist Loba Sweski just used a name to describe these hyper disconnected human beings and he called them pathocrats and their regimes as pathocracies. And I think that's a really appropriate word. Putin's regime is becoming increasingly pathocratic by the day and anyone who contradicts his false story that he's trying to get his peoples to believe is either imprisoned or eliminated. And Netanyahu's linking up with the right and dividing his, with the ultra-right and dividing his country in two is just his attempt 
to save his own skin from his criminal indictments. All these pathocrats are criminals. They're, they've they've committed all sorts of crimes, um, both um, and sort of now now sort of Netanyahu is not just a crime, um, a criminal in terms of sort of having done a lot of dodgy deals. He's now committed crimes against humanity. And look at Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, the genocidal supreme leader of Iran, who, as I said, funds Hamas and regularly orders women who oppose his repressive, misogynistic travesty of Islam to be raped, tortured, or shot in the eye. These are dangerous men, and yet they're in power in their countries. How is this? I'm not trying to come to an answer, but I would like you to live in the question, sort of what has gone wrong that these men are in power in their countries when most of the people in their countries don't want to have these regimes. Now, as I said earlier on, the dreadful thing about war is that all the rule books get torn apart and it becomes a free for all to behave inhumanly. When you go into war, it doesn't matter if you're a terrorist or you're fighting for America against Vietnam. It allows you, war gives you permission for your dark side or your repressed Mr. Hyde part of your Dr. Jekyllness to come out of hiding and do its worst to bring your closet rapist, killer and torturer out into the open. So this happens in all wars. And I read a very interesting survey about what made people participate in the terribly grisly massacres that took place in Rwanda. And what transpired was that the perpetrators were mainly men and were ordinary people caught up in extraordinary circumstances. In other words, these men were not particularly violent, but they found themselves caught up in particular opportunities that allowed for it, and war is such an opportunity. see the same in football matches. Somehow it allows for the violence to come out and those the clashes that take place between the two sides. You know, if all the fans of whatever team you support carry guns, you'd see a lot of um, you'd see a lot of deaths. And the most tragic thing about war, as I see it, or one of the most tragic things is that it's, it's seen as something noble. God is on your side because you're fighting for a just cause. So whether it's Hamas fighting to rid the world of an evil, materialistic, godless, Western culture, so they may establish their godly Sharia law where women are denied all rights and stoned to death if adulterous, or whether it's the Crusaders in the Middle Ages butchering the vile infidel in the name of Christ. So often the spiritual power is invoked, and this is happening in Russia at this moment, 
And Putin has got the Orthodox Church on his side, preaching that it's noble for young men to go out and fight and die for their beloved country. Indeed, as I think I said earlier, over the centuries, more people have died in the name of God than over anything else. Isn't it extraordinary that we kill people because of what we believe and they believe, and if they don't believe the same thing as us? And I think that's because we get so identified by our beliefs. I was talking the other day to a very um, conspiracy theorist person who, who got in touch with me. And I just began to challenge sort of one of the things that he believed in. And I said, but how do you know that that's for sure? And he began tremendous, got terribly threatened. And I saw that his whole self-identity evolved around his being right that his conspiracy theory, I mean, it was a pretty cuckoo one, that his conspiracy theory was how the world really is. So one of the characteristics of the warmonger or the hyper-disconnected pathocrat is that he, and it's generally a he, is totally left-brained. And the right hemisphere of their brain is non-existent. And this impacts strongly about how a person sees and therefore conducts themselves in the world. Put another way, the rational side of us, uh, the rational side of the pathocrat predominates and the heart dimension of them, the part that is gracious, empathic and altruistic fails to enter the picture. Larry Culliford in a interesting article in Paradigm Explorer, he described this very well. The left hemisphere, he said, working like a spotlight, insists on the familiar, rejecting new ideas, even in the face of good evidence, attending to minutia, breaking everything down into constituent parts. The right hemisphere, by contrast, is more like a floodlight, seeking out what is new, appreciating things whole, and in broad context, intent on grasping the bigger picture. So the non-right-brained pathocrat has little feeling and little sense of the future, and this impacts upon his decision-making. Everyone agreed that Putin made a great mistake thinking he could just walk into Ukraine and there would be no resistance. At every single level, he miscalculated. He miscalculated psychologically, he miscalculated militarily, and he didn't think of what this might lead to in the future. Because the pathocrat is cunning, his left brain, rational, um, shining on individual problems, part is strong, but there's no vision. Similarly, I think that's probably so with Hamas as well. And I'm sure they are regretting what they did. And I always have a certain suspect of those people who say that I live in order to die, in order to be a martyr. I think that once you get involved in life long enough, you start to realize that however much you've been brainwashed, that this may not be a sensible way to see the world. Because there, um, certainly all the people involved in the raid and 
most of the people who live in Gaza, the, the Hamas in Gaza, are probably going to be extinguished together with all the Palestinians. So again, you see Netanyahu's stupidity in not being honest, not taking responsibility, not standing up and saying, look, I made a mistake. I, I took my eye off the defense of my country. I was involved in other things. Instead, he blames everyone else. And it's not his fault that his country isn't ready but it's the fault of the army. It's stupid, it's dumb, but, and as a result, Israel will become less, not more safe, and the problem of what will happen in Gaza will become more intractable. And the problem is that most wars are attempts to solve a conflict at the level it exists at, forgetting that, as Einstein quite rightly said, no problem can be solved at the level it exists at, but it has to be solved at a higher level. And they and the warmongering, pathocratic mindset can't do that because it doesn't have that higher level. And that's why, as you'll be seeing in the healing of war, what also needs to happen is our human evolution so that we move to that higher level and are able truly to find how to reconcile conflicts instead of make them worse. Because the Dalai Lama was dead right when he said, if you use violence to reduce disagreements and conflict, then we must accept it every day. And that, my dear friends, is why violence persists in the world. I'm going to say a few words about the Iraq war. I'm not calling its instigators Bush and Blair pathocrats. I certainly think they're part of the system and warmongers, but they're not insane psychopaths. But nonetheless, this did not stop this war being embarked upon and conducted with the utmost stupidity and without, again, completely left brain and no vision, no vision of what it's going to lead to. And a kind of reaction. Bush wanting to prove his virility after the 9-11 attacks. And I, again, see the deception in the war. And I have a sneaking sense that if it weren't for the rich oil mines, oil wells in Iraq, that Saddam would probably have been left well alone by the Americans to murder and torture his peoples to his heart's content. So there again, we see the desire of a war to get power, the power of those goddamn oil wells. A lot of people grew very rich out of the Iraq war at the expense of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis being killed. And, and of course, we know now that it was bogus in um, the fabricated information thing that, that Saddam had, his, his weapons of mass destruction. And also because the war was not planned properly, the 
because it wasn't against the people. It was supposed to be a, a war of liberation. We're going to liberate you from your tyrant and save the world from his weapons of mass destruction. What happened was that the Americans behaved as conquerors, not liberators, and they didn't enlist the hearts and souls of the Iraqi people. In fact, not only did it not rid the world of terrorists, which was another aim, but it actually brought more of them out of the woodwork. Because what is not understood, and Asilla Elworthy in her organization, Peace Direct, you know, that she's a big um, um, campaigner for peace in the world. What war leaders don't understand is that terrorism is a tactic rather than a definable enemy. And their numbers are controlled by the level of anger and hate that drives people to join their ranks. Actually, I see terrorism as one of the many symptoms of a system which enables repression, inequality, poverty, greed, and inhumanity to persist. And as mosquitoes breed in swampy terrain, a terrorist prime breeding ground is a place like Gaza. Okay, that you can reduce their numbers on the surface by killing them, but that's only addressing the symptoms and no solution. Wars don't solve things. They generally make things worse because the solution exists at the higher level. The terrorist issue is not going to go away until the issue of poverty is addressed. And what a lot of people don't know is that a high percentage of men, young men, join up with terrorist organizations because it's the only way to have to make some money and support their families. The then British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, committed to joining the war for equally dumb reasons. <clears throat> An insecure man, he didn't have money in his background and felt a little inadequate, but he didn't own it because that kind of left brain mindset is not very introspective. He, he was unaware of the demons inside him that were driving him, of his vanity and, and narcissism. He wanted to be fated by the world as the great conqueror and liberator of the world from the terrible Saddam Hussein and the partner of the great world power, America, all this vanity. And he did this, it was even stronger. I mean, what happened at the time was the biggest anti-war demonstration that's ever taken place in England, but Blair didn't listen to it. And as a result, for many years, he was regarded as a pariah. I think he's now grown out of it. And a few years ago was made Sir Tony Blair. So now he has at last recovered one presumes. Um, but um, in Sam Keane's words again, we often create evil out of our highest ideals and most noble aspirations. Blair thought he was noble. Healing is not a noble activity. So the tragedy 
is that the war-mongering mindset is devoid of having any understanding of either of the demons inside them that propel them to do what they do. I mean, I'm sure that, that Putin has no knowledge of his inadequacies that um, allow him to play out the role as the dictator of his inadequacies and his need for power and, and um, prestige. Um, he projects it all on the evil West who are trying to destroy Russia. The West is not trying to destroy Russia. If Putin had not invaded Ukraine, his position in the world would have been one of, com of commanding much more respect than does at the moment. So what the warmonger, primarily left-brained human being suffers from is delusion. And we're deluded if we don't have any vision or intuition about things. People can delude us can, um, can con us if we have no ability to sense into what they're really about. I have a friend who said I can smell out con men very easily. I have another friend whose capabilities are not as, um, as acute, who's who's sniffing out abilities for con men is not so good and he's often been conned. So the warmonger, because he has little connection with his inner life and it's all on the outer and he has no connection to, his, to the right side of his brain that's about vision and what's going to happen. That's why he makes so many mistakes. And in all these wars, apart from Zelensky, who's the one noble character that comes out of it all, they're all completely deluded. Netanyahu, the Hamas leaders, um, the um, Iran, and of course Putin, they're all deluded. They've all made mistakes. They've all acted stupidly, just like Blair and Bush acted stupidly in that terrible Iraq war that cost so many thousands of lives. So wars tend to be fought out of their initiators, wounded egos, their insecurity, and putting what they believe is their own interest first. To quite disregard the preciousness or the sanctity of human life. And I think a great example of this again was, is in Putin's bombing of the grain harvest of produced by Ukraine, which goes out to feed the poorest and the most hungry people in the world. For Putin, it doesn't matter that a lot of people go hungry and, and the grain does not get to them. What matters to Putin is that he can do as much damage to Ukraine as possible. I mean, what a pathetic and sad way to live. For Putin, the poor can bloody well starve if it's in the interest of Russia. So I'm going to end my talk there. I'm sorry if I waffled on a little bit too much for some of you who um, I know that you like quick things, and this isn't a quick issue, but 
you can go from here to listening to my other talk where I discuss what we can do about all this. So thank you very, very much. Ah, it's nice to be relieved of my glasses. Thank you, and I bless you, and I wish you all the best.